Well, speaking of sanity, uh, you had written a, a very interesting paper after the beginning of the Iraq War in 2003, in which you discuss the um, the uh, the question of what is sanity. It was what uh, Rumsfeld is strange love too, and. Uh, you know, it seemed like an interesting question because there's a lot of discussion about what insanity is. We've been discussing that on and off in these webcasts recently about the youth culture, the the problems that people have, and then um, in terms of actually creating a active approach to what sanity is, I have a question for you about your approach to economics and your relationship with your friend Bernard Riemann, because you've got a very unique approach, one where you know, as I find it, you know, with meetings with political meetings, with discussions in the House of Representatives, people have got a lot of problems understanding things in economics that are actually very simple, uh, basically because they've got a lot of very wrong uh, views, such as looking at an economy in terms of money and other more specific ones. And that's not something that uh, you, you don't seem to be afflicted by that problem. Now, in your, in your new paper, um, whose name I don't recall at the moment, the, your latest paper on the website, you discuss the connection between your thoughts as a young man when confronted with Euclidean geometry and your rejection of that in favor of a physical approach to geometry, and you recount your later exposure to Bernard Riemann as sort of putting these things together for you. I was wondering if you could, uh, if you could tell us what, uh, how Riemann or how, how this idea has, has shaped, your, shaped your view of economics. Well, there are two parts of Riemann's paper, habilitation paper, <coughs> dissertation. One part is the opening part, which just tears apart all the garbage that was conventional in, in that time. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful, delightful, I, it was a rich experience all on its own. <coughs> now, there are middle parts which begin to pull together certain crucial foundations of a new system distinct from the one that he's proposing to junk. <clears throat> and this goes to a certain point. Then the whole thing gets more and more fun in a new way, up until one point which is very interesting, because there's a conclu oh, concluding section which lays out a whole positive conception of what the principles, the physical principles are of economy, in fact. But then there's a last sentence. And it's really a gem. It's like, there's another famous statement like that. Since uh, we're all idiots, we'll, um, we'll have to do something different. And this is the kind of thing that uh, Goethe did with his, some, some of his, his wit witticisms back in that, that good time. But the last sentence, um, since we're not mathematicians but physicists, we're going to have to, we're going to stop our report right now and go on to something new. <laughs> and that's the way it goes, so, uh, constantly. So that people, people were believing in, well, there's also a deeper question here. Is our conception of society, conception of humanity, really sane? Aren't there not, aren't there principles which is what we believe about sense perception, is that true? And I say, no, it's not true. If you look at the history, if you look at the history of species, you, you divide this, the animal species, for example, into two categories. One category is, well, people who like money. The other category is those who like the future of mankind. And that's the difference, and that's what that's what Riemann rep represented. And you see this, you see this. It comes most to the fore. That specific thing comes most to the fore with Max Planck and Albert Einstein. They are the two two most typical people who re represent that bridge of what what Riemann intended, what Riemann's intention was. Go, goes into many things which are valuable. He didn't live very long, so what he did what he did for Italy, science in Italy, was tremendous. He practically created a science. Uh, science, Italian science, and it involved all kinds of wonderful things, which I dealt with in terms of some of my projects back in the strategic defense uh, period, uh, and it was all already there. 
And it was, it was Riemann who, with his relationship with his, this group of Italian friends, largely from northern Italy, but they moved down around Rome and had this big lake, you know, they, would, they did little things. And so he actually created a, a leap in science, which was specifically a branch of his work, because he had this uh, disease and he was going to die of it because the whole family had this particular type of tuberculosis. And so he would go, he would live le more and more of his time in Italy because he couldn't stand the cold climate because his, he was dying, effectively. And he was spending his time while dying in, do in working with his Italian friends and made some absolutely brilliant achievements. And I, I saw some of those in various museums and in talking to people. And when I did the, yes, the uh, space program, which I did then. Uh, that was one of my plain features. I actually had an Italian de scientist, designer, who designed the aircraft, which uh, uh, the, uh, the would view, was used intensely to get to Mars. And uh, that was an Italian e designer who changed the configuration on a plane and we, with a known fuel system, a type of fuel system. And it, that would have worked. I don't know if it would have gotten to Mars, but I, I didn't, wasn't worried too much about that at that time. I thought about 40 years we should be able to do something in that direction. But uh, that, was the, that was the idea. But, uh, that's, uh, but Riemann is, is very precious to me because he has, despite the kind of sad life in terms of health care that he lived and the kind of conditions under which people in science lived then, that this man had, was, had, had a tremendous sense of humor which you find com displayed in the opening section of his, his uh, habilitation dissertation. He tears every piece of idiocy apart before getting on to serious business. Now the man is brilliant he's up and he's one of the greatest minds and I put him together immediately he belongs together with Max Planck who was a really a, a super genius in many respects. He was a great musician as well as being a great physical scientist and he had similar affinities with Albert Einstein, who had a similar kind, a musician and scientist. And so uh, these kinds of people uh, are the ones who, from proximate to my own existence, are the ones that I feel most comfortable with.